Yes. Yeah. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah. yeah, now we have Greg Sutcliffe with stats update. Thank you. Um, so let's just see if I can get this working. Is that, is that I've, no, I, I can't see me because they're in the same browser. Is that? Yeah, so you see okay? your Good. slides, yes. Super. Well, let me start the local recording then. Okay, so um, yeah, hi everybody. So yeah, my name is Greg, and I'm the the data scientist for the Ansible community. Um, so uh, part of that means that I work for you folks. As okay, mostly I do my work through Gundalo and his newly expanded team, but I'm always open to um, having chats about stats and having a, a discussion about things that might be interesting. Studies we can do, one-off graphs we can come up with, or, or ongoing metrics to look at. Always, always happy to chat about all that kind of stuff. And so do come and find me. Um, you can find me as Gun Gilvan on IRC, Twitter, Mastodon, Matrix, um, all over the place. The one place that that's not true is GitHub. And literally, that's just because redirecting repos is annoying. So um, come and talk to me. I would love love to hear your thoughts on things. So uh, today, I'm going to keep it fairly high level and a bit shorter, um, because I think I do tend to go on a bit too much. But one thing I have been promising to the community for a while is that I would do a, a sort of stats look at how well Collections has gone. And now seems to be the optimum time. It's been a year since uh, we first started moving things out into community general, and um, you know, not quite a year since the big sort of pull the trigger and move everything out of Ansible Ansible. So it seemed sensible to have a look back over that last year and just see where we are at, you know, one year on, how is it going? Um, and yeah, uh, we're going to look at this through a few different lenses. So the, the, the format's going to be that uh, I'm going to show you the same graph uh, for the old world and the new world, and we can see the comparison and how things are going. So uh, just a note on what the data sources are. So for collections, the data sources are very much that uh, it's it's not quite everything that goes into Ansible, but it's close. So I have a list of, of collections uh, that I run a GitHub indexer on uh, once a day, and I dump all of that sort of issues and PRs data into a MongoDB locally so that I don't have to be bound by GitHub's rate limits. So that's... Uh, uh, and many thanks to Civil for his scripts for that because that's what I use. Uh, so that's that's the the new data. So it's not it's not quite everything in Ansible, but it's close. Um, and if you ever feel like your yours is not being covered, then the the actual code for the crawler is is on GitHub, and and I can take PRs to the to the config. For the old data, I quite specifically use one year of data from mid twenty eighteen to mid twenty nineteen. Why is that? Well, it's one year so that it matches the one year of collections. So we're looking at the same time frame. And it's up to the mid twenty. So it literally goes to the last day of July, in in 2019. Because after that was when we started really talking about collections, making big noises about collections. You know, Atlanta was only a month after that where we made some big announcements. And you can see quite clearly in the data that contribution to Ansible Ansible drops off sharply after that. And so it's no longer representative data of where we had got to, uh, what the state of the community was like uh, when we got there. So. It's one year of, of Ansible Ansible to, to mid 2019 versus one year of collections data to March 2021. Let's get started. Uh, so first things first, where were we? This is both the issues and PRs data from Ansible Ansible. And you can see that we had you know 2,000 open PRs and 4,000 open issues. This is not filtered. Um, this, is, uh, this is everything. So if you wanted a really, really representative sample, you'd filter these to anything touching lib Ansible modules. That turns out to be quite hard to do because PRs don't contain paths. Commits contain paths, but PRs can have multiple commits. Uh, and so dereferencing that for 20,000 PRs across the whole of the Ansible Ansible history is quite expensive, uh, and so I didn't. Uh, but so this is going to be slightly inflated. But still, we know there were a lot of PRs. We know there was a huge backlog. We know that was a struggle for maintainers. Just for fun, I did a forecast of that time series out to uh, out to now. Um, so you can see what I mean about it dropping off after mid twenty nineteen. Uh, so that's why I don't use that as representative data. But I did a forecast from there to now, and you can see it, it, it could it definitely was going up, and it could be anything as high as you know, two and a half thousand, maybe even if we were unlucky, three thousand PRs in that backlog if we'd done nothing. In reality, I don't think it would have got that high. I think contributors would have walked away. Um, but you know that would be fixing the problem in entirely the wrong way, uh, not the way we we would like to fix it. Let's look at how things are today. 
Um, so this is, uh, apologize for the slightly different format of the forecast, um, technical reasons I can explain if you want. Um, but here's the backlog from collections. So obviously from March 2020, it starts from very close to zero because that's when we first started creating collections. It ramps up very quickly. And today we have a backlog of approximately 400 PRs uh, open um, with a forecast three months out of anywhere between about the same to maybe another couple of hundred on top of that. Now that's obviously much lower than the backlog that was in Ansible Ansible, but it's still rising quite rapidly. Uh, and so I think this is not terrible, um, but I think it is potentially a cause for concern. However, there are two reasons to have some hope. The first is the obvious one, uh, which Gondolo has already talked about, which is that the team is much larger now. We've hired new people, including Anderson, who just joined in the last month or so. Um, so we're still expanding the team out, still ramping those people up. They're going to make an impact for sure. This is good. Uh, the second reason that I would have some hope is that this is um, this doesn't account for the fact that we've brought a lot of new collections into being in the last year. You know, on the left hand side of this graph down here, um, you know, in sort of April and May, there were very few collections compared to now, with seventy or eighty collections that are being indexed by my crawler. That's slowing down. And so, if you were to go back and maybe look at this as issue a backlog divided by the number of repos, so you know, an average backlog per collection or something like that, I think this would look quite a lot different. Um, sadly, for time reasons, I didn't get a chance to do that. I would like to. Uh, but I think I think when you take those two things into consideration, I think we've got some, some hope that this is not actually as bad as it seems. And I'm making some thoughts for the next time, uh, and so hopefully I can present a better version of this uh, later on. But equally, I think the number of collections is likely to stabilize to some degree. Uh, I think it will go up a bit, a bit more yet, but not at the rate we have seen. Uh, so that will also help to stabilize things a bit as well. So that's the backlog. However, even if you take the view that the backlog is not terrible, there are two reasons why you can have no backlog, right? The one is that, that you're fixing the problem and you're merging PRs as fast as possible. The other is that just no one's submitting any PRs, uh, and that would be a bad way to fix the problem. So let's check that and have a look at the PR volume. Happily, that is not the case. So what you are looking at here is the daily uh, volume of PRs merged, uh, because that's the bit uh, that's that's you know that's getting the work done right. You can open as many PRs as you like, but if they're not getting merged, we have a problem. Uh, so. Average per day, that's the smooth line uh, through the curves. You can see the new data on the left, Ansible, Ansible in red on the right. Um, and you've got, it's you know, it's it's not terrible. It's a bit lower, but you know, things are still ramping up, so that's fine. Uh, in terms of total number of uh, of merged PRs, it's, it's close to half. It's close to half, um, but that's okay. Again, we're still ramping up. We've got, uh, you know, the Ansible, Ansible had a history of nearly 10 years, so it had time. And again, that's not filtered. Uh, to live Ansible modules, so there will be PRs in that backlog that have nothing to do with the community, or at least not directly. I mean, community can obviously still contribute to the core engine, but it's not the, the collections world that we care about, right? So um, equally on the left in the collection data, we're not filtering out things like backport PRs here. So there'll be a certain amount of inflation, particularly in repos like community uh, community.general, uh, where that'll be slightly inflated. I had a look, there's about 300 or so PRs with a backport label on, so it's not it's not a big problem. Um, so I didn't bother to go to the effort of taking it out of the graph. Um, that's good. Uh, the other thing we might care about is uh, contributors. So if we don't have any contributors, uh, if these if these PRs are all coming from a small handful of people, that's not healthy. You know, okay, it's nice to have the throughput. It's nice to have uh, the, the merges happening. But if we've got a bus factor problem, we need to check for that as well. So here, um, I didn't do this as a daily or, or weekly graph because a lot of this, I think that tends to mask whether you're getting contribution from the same people all the time. So instead, we're going for a cumulative graph here. So we start from time zero. So that's 2018 for the old data, March 2020 for the new data. And we just count up the, the total number of um, unique contributors as we go uh, through that data set. And so that's pretty straightforward. You can see how that works out. And um, it's not terrible. We're, we're sitting at about two thirds of the number of unique contributors that we had uh, at the end of sort of end of life of Ansible Ansible's uh, collection holding status. It's not terrible. It's still going up. Again, more collections will be coming online. There'll be maintainers, new people there. What I, what I am encouraged by is while the slope of the blue line is not as steep as the as the one in Ansible Ansible, um, it is it is still increasing. It's not flattening off. Right. It's pretty straight, and that's nice to see. It will tail off eventually, uh, but that's that's pretty nice to see. 
So that's pretty pretty happy. Uh, and then the last one I want to talk about is time to merge because um, this is all great in terms of keeping things under control and not burning out your maintainers, but you also need to give a good experience to the people who are submitting the pull request, right? So this is time to close. And this was where Ansel Ansel really struggled. So you can see this is... Um, and this is me doing my clever metrics around um, around uh, time to event data. Uh, so this is not a mean. Uh, specifically, I'm calculating here the time to the, the time at which your PR will have a 75% chance of being merged. Because I feel like that's a good threshold. We don't want to we don't want half our community to have a bad time, right? That's the problem I have with a mean is that you're saying, well, okay, if my mean time is good, uh, then half my community get, get this or better. But what about the other half, right? And I don't feel like that's very representative. I'd like three quarters of my community to have a pretty good time. So I'm calculating that and then I'm, and then I'm, I'm sort of recreating the state of the repo going backwards in time. So at the very edge of this red graph here, um, this will be a, a year's worth of data back to 2017, and then so on. Every data point as we go forwards is a year's worth of data up to that data point. Um, so that makes it very volatile for collections because obviously there isn't really very much data to the left of this graph, uh, but there is um, there is plenty of data to the left of the red graph, right? So it's a bit volatile here and then it settles down. What you can clearly see is that we're doing a much, much better job of keeping that time to merge down. Uh, so it's currently in the region of about eight or nine days for collections as a whole at the moment, whereas it was more like 50 uh, for Ansible, Ansible. And I think that's a huge win for, for the people writing the PRs and trying to get contributions in. And it's it's a pretty nice win for the maintainers as well, because I think um, it helps keep that cognitive load down. When you know you've got a big backlog of PRs that have been open for ages, that's a burden. I've been there. Um, it's, it's not nice. So being able to keep things moving quickly is, is a win for everybody, I think. So that's my really quick take. I've only got three minutes left. Uh, so uh, what's my conclusions? I think it's pretty good. Uh, it's better than I expected, if I'm being entirely honest. Before I looked at the data, I sort of sat down to think about what I expected to see. This is always good practice with data, because if you don't meet your expectations, either the data is wrong or your expectations are wrong, and it's good to figure out which is which. Uh, in this case, I think I'm pretty sure I, my expectations were wrong, uh, and this is actually better than I thought. I'm concerned about that backlog drift, but... As I said, we've got a bigger team, and, and a lot of this is on me because um, I'm doing a weekly report for Gundalo, uh, and so we're going to work out what, what are the right metrics in there to keep track of this and figure out when we need to call for things like PR days and so on um, and any other initiatives we can come up with. So that's going to be uh, something I'm working on in the next few months. Everything else looks fine. I definitely want to keep an eye on this one um, because this data set is, uh, at least for collections, this, this requires a lot of data to generate, and so it's a bit uncertain at the moment um especially this left hand side so watching this sort of sliding window as we move into the next year uh, i'm going to be keeping around this one and making sure this doesn't get out of control because i think it's important um we may also need to treat a couple of our larger and special repos separately community general community network are a kind of special case i think um I mean, if you look at the number of PRs merged, like, you know, a good thousand plus of them come from Community General, right? Um, so it's uh, it's definitely a bit of an edge case. I already have some dedicated metrics for Community General. Um, we may widen that out and then not track them in the in the larger set of uh, things. So we'll see how that goes. Going to break that out maybe next time. Anyway, I'm running out of time, so I will wrap up there. Uh, so if you need to find me, uh, here's my contact details. Uh, so Twitter, Mastodon, IRC, Matrix, you can find me, drop me an email, whatever. Happy to chat about this some more. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, have we got any questions? Yes, this one from Mark Chappell. Do you have mm -hmm. these stats on a per collection basis? Yes. Um, so there is a dashboard. It's a bit broken at the moment. Um, and the reason it's not fixed is because no one's complained about it. Uh, you can absolutely see. Um, so the time to merge and the sort of uh, backlog views absolutely work. There was a sort of trend analysis thing, which was recording daily data calculated from the, the raw GitHub data back into Mongo. And that I don't think is working properly. I can probably show it if we've got a moment. Um, so if you go to, I'll put this in the slides or something later, but if you go to stats.eng.ansible.com, that's my my stats server, you can go to collection metrics. I don't know which collections are of interest uh, to you, Mark, but I'm just going to pick one at random or someone can tell me in chat um, which one I should look at. Uh, but here's Kuz General. So this, this refreshes daily. Um, and you can see here we have got you know time to close, 
You can also look at time to first comment, which I think is quite interesting from a maintainer perspective, like how quickly are people responding? Uh, oh, it's being a bit slow to say, there we go. So you can get that. And this is for issues and pull requests. I, I should have said, I, I showed mostly pull requests throughout the talk, all, largely all the same conclusions apply for issues. The numbers are a bit higher. It takes longer to close issues because you've got troubleshooting and so on. Um, but you know, largely the same same conclusions hold. Um, so you can look at that. There's also a Galaxy releases thing, but it's, it's kind of a bit rubbish to be honest. So um, these graphs definitely work. These summaries are fine. You can get totals of your labels. Um, the one thing that does not work very well at the moment is um, this down here. Like the time to the the the, the trend in time to close for for community journal is not like 300 days, right? So this is this is definitely broken. Um, but these these graphs are fine. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I don't see any other questions in chat, at least. On it's IRC, super, is there well, anything? Yeah, on IRC, there's a question from Brian about which repos we, we track. Um, it, it's roughly equivalent to the collections that go in the um, in the Ansible package. Um, so the majority of GitHub Ansible collections and a few other ones that live in different places, Chocolatey, uh, OpenStack. Um, if you think we should track more, um, let us know. Or raise a pull request. We'll put those links in the meeting notes in the blog post. Cool. Yes, and that's going to link to my blog there as well, where I tend to write up things uh, that are a bit more in depth. Uh, so if you're interested in how these things are generated, if you've got any ideas for blog posts, I'll take them because you know, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'm done. All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, next up, we have David with Ansible version changing. Ansible version changing? What? I didn't know. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> right, what it says me... on the agenda. I hope you, you know what you're doing. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, OK, let me let me share my screen. Hopefully, this works. Please let me know if it does work. Yes? No? Yes, I, I, I do. OK, great. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so I'm uh, David Morissimard, uh, as uh, you know, you might know me on IRC as GM Simard. Um, I just wanted to give uh, a quick update around Ansible 3.0, uh, how we got there and what's next. Um, before we begin, I thought I, I, I'd introduce uh, myself, or rather ourselves, uh, as uh, Ansible community on IRC. Um, you know, we're, we're really trying to reach out and uh, get people interested and involved in uh, contributing. Uh, you can find us on Freenode, of course. Uh, we have meetings to which you are invited uh, every week at uh, 7 UTC, uh, 7 p.m. UTC. Uh, there's an agenda. You can add items there um, and you know um, participate in the meetings. Um, what do we do? Um, well, uh, amongst other things, uh, we're uh, responsible for releasing the Ansible community package and manage the, uh, the collections that are included in it. Uh, we, we, we try to foster collaboration, you know, get people to work together, uh, but also bridge the gap between, uh, you know, the different communities, working groups, uh, projects and products. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people working uh, in and around Ansible, uh, and we try to we try our best to, you know, get people working together. Uh, we're, uh, we, um, we like to improve tooling, workflows and processes for contributors and uh, maintainers alike. Uh, and you know we we we're trying very hard about doing outreach, communication, uh, and events. Uh, you know, just like this one. Um, so let me, let me tell you a, a quick story. Uh, long story short, uh, you know, once upon a time, seven years and ten minutes or less. Uh, please keep me honest. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, my story starts in 2014, and I didn't even know I had I had to look this up uh, for this presentation because when I started using Ansible. I was around uh, 1.9 or so, uh, and this split was already done. So it turns out that Ansible Ansible was once <laughs> um, a repo, a single repo, and then it was split out to um, Ansible Modules Core and Ansible Modules Extras. So how it worked back then, so you had the Ansible Ansible repo, you had two extra repos, um, and, and there were Git sub modules and stuff like that. Um, and the, I just want to mention throughout the presentation, there are links here. Uh, the slides will be available, so you can uh, you know walk through this uh, yourself uh, afterwards. 
Um, so then in 2016, um, you know, uh, we, we, we decided, you know, we should uh, actually merge everything back into a single repo. Uh, why are we doing this again? Well, you know, there were some reasons, um, not going to go into too much details here in the best interest of time. Uh, but the gist of it was, um, you know, uh, it was not, uh, the, the, for all intents and purposes, uh, it didn't work out as well as we had hoped. So, you know, we went back to a single repo. Um, but then, you know, the, the situation got a bit out of hand. You know, uh, Greg mentioned earlier, a uh, couple thousands uh, Pull requests is hard to keep track. It turns out that it's hard to keep track of everything into a single repo, um, regardless of whether we thought it was a great idea or not. So uh, our friend uh, and longtime contributor, uh, GP Mance, uh, sometimes in 2019, uh, came out with a blog post saying, you know, I care about Ansible, but it's getting really hard to contribute and get stuff merged in. Uh, eventually, uh, we, we started talking about collections and how uh, the future of the project might look like if we well, if we split things again, I guess, um, uh, but this time in you know more than three repos with collections being standalone physically. Um, I invite you to read more about this. Uh, it's not something that came out of the blue or anything. Uh, there, there are links to the blog post there uh, talking about you know what 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 triggers uh, what made us think you know that we should do this again. Uh, in uh, September 2020, you know, about a year back, um, Ansible 2.10 released, um, and Ansible 2.10 was the first release where we had um, uh, the Ansible Ansible uh, core repo uh, or Ansible base uh, actually, um, and then um, the Ansible package on, on PyPy, which was, um, you know, uh, had a dependency on Ansible base and then brought in all the collections on top uh, to keep the backwards compatibility with 2.9 uh, and to you know keep um, what what sometimes we call the kitchen sink uh, you know are the batteries included uh, inside the package so that people could just keep installing Ansible and it just works uh, like it used to. Um, 2021 February uh, last month we released 3.0 uh, and uh, it was a um, Technically speaking, it was not that big of a deal because, well, it turns out that we used the same Ansible base and we used um, almost the same collections as 2.10, maybe a few uh, a few additional ones. Um, but it was the first version where we had semantic versioning, uh, 3.0, and then you know everyone started talking about, oh no, it's 3.0, it's going to be backwards and compatible, it's going to break everything, <laughs> it confused a lot of people. Uh, so you know, we got we got some blog posts out, and I invite you to read them again. Um, but the, the gist of it is that actually not much changed uh, for three uh, at least when compared to two point ten. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, looking a little bit forward, uh, next month in April twenty twenty one, Ansible Core two point ten is planned to be released. Um, and this is no secret, you know, you can, it's in the roadmap on GitHub and, and it's actually uh, rendered in the docs uh, as well. Uh, you can look at this, you can uh, even submit a PR if you care. <laughs> but uh, it, what, I, what I mean is, uh, you know, this is, not, um, this is not something that is hidden. Uh, you can look at it and uh, see what's coming uh, for yourself if you want to. Uh, trailing uh, the, the release of Ansible Core 2.11, we'll have uh, Ansible 4.0. Um, and again, uh, the roadmap is in the Git repo. Um, so we're, we're, you know, once Ansible Core 2.11 releases, um, we'll uh, basically ship a new Ansible package with, you know, uh, updated versions of collections, uh, perhaps including breaking changes, because, um, you know, that's what semantic versioning allows us to. Uh, we need to release uh, major and breaking changes uh, every now and then. Um, this uh, particular cycle here, from February to May, it's not six months, right? It's a little bit shorter. Um, well, that's because we're uh, aligning ourselves with the release of Ansible Core. But uh, after that, it's going to be uh, every six months. And I'll, uh, I'll explain a little bit of that later. So, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of changes. Um, is it just me who's struggling to keep up with these changes? That's you know, uh, 
uh, <laughs> a, a, a considerate user, you know, went through the uh, the the work of uh, you know doing this meme, and I thought it was a little bit funny. Uh, but also, you know, it, it was, I felt it was appropriate to include in these slides because, well, you know, we got a lot of people confused about, um, you know, there's a lot of things moving around um, and it's hard to keep up. Um, for the record, though, uh, the meme was almost correct and I did reply to this user. Um, so Ansible Core does not become Ansible 4.0. Um, you know, Ansible 4.0 will depend on Ansible Core. Uh, but I have a better uh, diagram for that later. So, you know, this is a little bit confusing. Uh, David, can you give it to me in, you know, a single line or something? Well, I got this quote from Girling Guy uh, in the Ansible community uh, IRC channel. And he said, and he said this, you know, amongst other things. He says, well, someone should just be like, look, it's Ansible Core, the open source engine or runtime, if you will. Ansible, the community package on pip or PyPy and Ansible automation platform, the, the paid and licensed product, which includes, you know, uh, Tower and an automation hub and, and so on. And really, you know, it's it's not much more than that. Um, you have the runtime, you have uh, the package, which includes the runtime and the collections. And then you have, you know, uh, the paid platform if you want to support and, um, you know, whatever the, the, the product offers. Um, and then the other, um, the other thing was about semantic versioning. Um, it, it should not come across as confusing. You know, it's a way to describe our, our signal uh, backwards compatibility or lack thereof. Uh, you know, uh, it, it allows you to pin versions so you don't get you know breakage uh, unexpectedly. <laughs> and uh, there's this little introduction here that I, I must I must read uh, because I think it's. <laughs> It's kind, of, it's kind of funny, actually. Uh, in the world of software management, there exists a dreaded place called dependency hell. The bigger your system grows and the more packages you integrate into your software, the more likely you are to find yourself one day in this pit of despair. So I don't think we're in the pit of despair right now, but you know, it, <laughs> looking forward, I'm hopeful that you know, semantic versioning will allow us to uh, do a better job at you know, uh, packaging all these collections. Um, providing updates to users uh, in a way that you know doesn't break them uh, all the time, um, and uh, you know, looking forward to that. Um, so, uh, in practice, what does this look like? Um, so, again, we started at two point nine. Everything was in a single repo, um, and then we we for two point ten we transitioned to uh, Ansible base, uh, which you know was Ansible Git repo, and then um, you know a curated or selected list of collections that that comes from Galaxy or, or GitHub repos. Um, then uh, for Tree which released last month, and this is why I say there's not a lot of technical changes under the hood for Tree is well, it's still the same Ansible based and roughly the same collections. So technically speaking, not a lot of change there. And um, you know, if you wanna, if you want to install Ansible Tree .o and then pin yourself so you don't, you know, get breaking changes unexpectedly in your CI or in your production or anything, you know, it allows you to pin to you know under 4.0, so you, you can still get updates for the Tree.x branch and you know, uh, keep your stuff uh, going. Um, then 4.0. Which is you know uh, a few a few months out, um, same thing, uh, but this time around, uh, Ansible Base is being renamed to Ansible Core, um, and will go to two point eleven. So uh, what's next? Well, we got uh, Ansible five point zero and Ansible Core two point twelve. Um, we'll be adopting a, around a six months uh, release cycle. Um, and just like we are trailing uh, the 2.11 release, uh, we'll be trailing the 2.12 release. So sometime in November, there's going to be a, an Ansible 5.0, which will ship or depend on uh, Ansible Core 2.12. And you know, in another six months after that, we'll have 6.0 and so on and so forth. Um, more, more reading. Um, these links were spread throughout the presentation, but you know, there's this one slide if you want to read more about this, what, I, what I've talked to you about. 
uh, there, there's this great blog post here by um, uh, Daniel, uh, who, who uh, puts into his own words um, some of the 3.0 things, and then link to the roadmaps uh, for uh, Ansible and Ansible Core. Um, that's what I had. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, if you want to stay up to date, so you, you're not as uh, you know, perhaps confused uh, in the future, I highly recommend signing up to the Bullhorn Ansible newsletter. Uh, it's you know uh, biweekly, and um, there uh, it's low signal to noise ratio, um, and it's highly targeted. You can also um, submit stuff, so you can. Uh, uh, add things to the bullhorn. Uh, the Ansible announced mailing list. Uh, Ansible account on Twitter if you're into that. Or, you know, join us on IRC. Uh, if you want to look at these slides, they're available here amongst other presentations. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. If I can. I mean, if there are no questions, that's OK, too. We can move on. But <laughs> I'll be happy to answer questions. We, we know this is a big change, right? Naming things and versions and numbers, they're two of the hard uh, problems in computing, right? Um, so if you're still confused by this, that is totally understandable. Um, I need to keep on referring back to like, the, the blog post that we've done in bits to uh, to check what we're doing. Um, one thing we are guilty of, and I myself are very guilty of, is changing the term of the Ansible package. Um, for example, there are some people that talk about ACD, the Ansible community distribution, because that's a term that we trade around and we use Ansible interchangeably, or the Ansible community project or the community Ansible project. Uh, we are slowly trying to go around and and normalize and fix all those names. So please so you do sort of bear with us. But just keep asking questions, right? You know, the, the one more we explain this, the better we get at um, being able to communicate this. David's done a great job on, on Reddit. If you use Reddit, there's a really amazing community there where we've been sort of getting a lot of questions and sort of honing and um, improving the message. Ah, there is a message in Julie. Yeah, we have a question from Abhijit. Do we have minor releases in 3? In three yes. Excellent question. I actually meant to mention that, and I forgot. So thanks for keeping me honest, Abhijit. Um, so I talked about you know, how we will be shipping major releases uh, every six months. Um, minor releases, so dot releases or patch release. Uh, no, not patch releases. I'm sorry. That's not the right term to use. Uh, in regards to semantic versioning, but uh, dot releases will ship about every three weeks. So about every two week, three weeks, we'll have you know a three dot one, three dot two, and so on. Um, you know, shipping updates that have merged uh, since the last dot release for collections. Um, it will you will never get an Ansible base or an Ansible core um, version uh, or major version bump between two uh, dot releases. Yes, so so Toshio uh, says on the chat, it's major, minor, and micro for semantic versioning. So the right, the right term would be a minor release, right? Any any other questions before we move on? Yeah, yeah, I have another question. So can you elaborate more, uh, like, what is the support cycle uh, depending upon the versions? Like how uh, we'll decide like what is supported right now and what is not supported going forward. Like let's assume that there is a fifth version, uh, and then uh, you have something older version. How will it decide, or is there any uh, information about that? Hmm. Um, I, I I don't I don't. I don't have a good answer to that, in part because the first half of your question sounded like garbled audio, and I know that's my fault. Uh, it's not yours. Um, so if I may ask you to repeat that again. 
yeah so the question is like uh, we have support metrics right so we decide like 2.8 is a security release then we decide like uh, 2.9 is a kind of a maintenance plus security patches so that kind of scenario will uh, occur in the 3.4. dot and 5. dot releases right so okay. how much we support yes okay excellent system. question and I, I see Toshio raising his hand. Uh, he, he probably wants to talk about the LTS uh, long-term support session that we'll have later today, where we're actually going to be discussing about this. Um, Toshio, did you want okay. to add anything? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so right now, there is no support for anything older. So Ansible 2.9 is maintained by the core team. Uh, it's a product that Red Hat sells support for, and that is still supported. 2.9. 10 is being produced by the community and uh, we we are no longer making any releases for it not security releases not bug fix releases nothing uh, now that ansible 3.0 is out when ansible 4.0 is out ansible 3.0 will no longer receive any updates now what i want to talk about at uh, you know later in the day is whether this is okay or not uh, we have limited people currently producing the releases. So if the community would like to have more support for these, uh, we'll need community members to step up and say, I'd like to go ahead and run the release process for older releases. Uh, and then you know, we can talk about how you can do that. What kind of support can I give you to get you up to speed? Uh, how to upload to PyPI, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the difficulties that you're going to run into uh, as we, if you want to do this. Um, and then we can try and work out how, as a project, we can make that happen. But so far, no one has come to me and said, this is a need that I have. Uh, so we haven't said that we're going to do it yet. M more broadly speaking, we're um, uh, we're working around release automation and you know uh, quality insurance and quality uh, testing for the package. So at least my hope is sometime in the future the release process is automated enough that it's it's not hard to ship new releases or uh, at least the plan is to make it easier to do releases um, without you know breaking anything. So we could we could put this into the hands of the community at some point if you know everything's automated anyway yeah yeah makes sense um Soren asks in the chat uh if ansible core releases exit wide one two three how long until ansible 3.x makes a new release my guess is that it does not have to do one as it is not pinning the core patch version. So, um, and Toshio, maybe you can keep me honest on this one if I'm wrong or mistaken. Um, so we're not, we're always going to keep this three weeks uh, minor release cycle, whether or not core or base releases something or not. At the, at the time of release, uh, it is not a strict pin, but is a lower boundary over whatever is the latest version of Ansible base. So for, uh, I won't go back to my slides, but on the slides, there were, there were um, uh, you know, for 2.10, the, the boundary was, you know, Ansible base 2.10. something. And then for 3.0, it was 2.10.5, right? Um, so it, it will go, it will allow you to update Ansible base or Ansible core, but it is not a strict, you know, um, requirement on the version. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, sorry. Cool. Thanks. Um, I think we can take a break now. And of course, you can continue uh, asking questions and chatting on the chat as well as on IRC. Mm -hmm. But um, it was supposed to be a 20 minute break, but since there's so much uh, discussion around this, uh, it will be a 15 minute break so that we can keep on schedule with the rest of the agenda. So take 15.
Thanks, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice, relatively short break. We'll have a longer break soon. But in the meantime, now we have Nikhil with the um, session on an exec sorry, execution environments via Ansible Builder. Nikhil, take it away. Thanks, Carol. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, please let me know if you see it. It's loading. OK. And now we see it. OK, perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikhil. I'm a senior software maintenance engineer with Red Hat. Today, I'm going to talk about execution environments and Ansible Builder. So uh, we'll discuss what is an execution environment, uh, what is Ansible Builder. And then I have a short demo where I show how to create an execution environment and then how to use it. Uh, I hope it works fine since my live demos never go good. Um, what is an execution environment? Uh, so uh, in uh, Ansible execution environment is a container image to run Ansible. Uh, in context of AWX, uh, execution environment is a replacement to custom virtual environments. Uh, we have had few shortcomings while using custom virtual environments, and execution environment kind of overcomes those shortcomings. Uh, execution environment enables the developers to use the container technology to build a predictable and a portable runtime environment to run Ansible. Uh, and since these are container images, uh, these can be easily shared uh, via private or a public registry. Uh, as you can see in the diagram, uh, 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 execution environment consists of uh, it consists of collections that you need. Uh, it consists of uh, Python libraries um, that you may need uh, for the execution of your playbooks. And then, of course, it has Ansible code inside it. And, and this is all built on a UBI uh, image. Uh, UBI 8 stands for Red Hat Universal Base Image. Uh, the Universal Base Image is basically designed uh, to, to be used as a base layer for all your cutterized applications. Um, this base image is uh, freely distribu uh, distributable. Uh, what is Ansible Builder? Uh, so with Ansible Execution Environment, uh, the next challenge is how do we enable users or developers to create these execution environments? Uh, and that's where you know Ansible Builder comes into picture. Uh, Ansible Builder is a CLI tool which aids uh, in creating those execution environments. Uh, it you know produces a portable or a self-contained environment, like I mentioned, or that is what the ex execution environment is. Uh, these execution environments which are created by Ansible Builder are compatible with Podman and Docker both. Uh, one thing which you know Ansible Builder enables you is you don't have to create those container files manually now. Uh, you don't have to worry about any of those uh, you know dependency issues or what you need and what you don't need in the uh, in the in the container image or in the execution environment that you are going to create. Uh, Ansible Builder will take care of it. Uh, in the demo, I will show what all you know definition files does Ansible Builder require and what it produces, basically. Uh, so let's see a short demo. So do you see my command line now? OK. No, we only see the, the demo. OK. okay. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen again with the command line. OK, I think it should come up now. Yes, we see it. OK, so so this is uh, a directory that I've got, and I've got a few files over here. Um, so I'm going to discuss about these definition files. Um, so this is the definition file which Ansible Builder reads by default. Uh, this is called as execution environment.yaml. Uh, so if I just open up that file, You'll see uh, there are a few other definition files inside that uh, execution environment YAML. Uh, 
the first is the galaxy requirements.yml uh, this is the similar requirements.yml that you usually use to get the collections and roles it's the same file exact same file uh, and then you see a requirements.txt uh, these are all the python libraries that you want to put in your execution environment um, since with the collection and you know the metadata that collection provides uh, usually if you install a collection it brings all the python dependencies with it as well uh, but if in case there are any extra python dependencies that you want to install in your execution environment you would put them in requirements.txt uh, and then the third is system so if you have any system dependencies that you want to put into your execution environment or the container image that you're going to create uh, you can put that in this uh, txt in, in this text file which is for the system uh, the pre the prep end and the append that you see uh, these are just the two commands that you can run uh, before and after creating your container um, this is just you know some additional steps that you want to do after creating your container image um, so, so so this is the definition file for ansible builder uh, like i mentioned right the requirements.yml is uh, just the same file that you use for collection um, so right now, what I'm going to do in this demo is I'm going to install this Amazon AWS collection in the container image that I'm going to create. Uh, and this will pull in everything uh, for that collection and also the Python dependencies. Um, so for this demo, what I've done is I've pre-created the, uh, the execution environment because it takes time. Uh, but I'm just going to run the command uh, which basically creates the uh, execution environment. So like I mentioned, you need to use Ansible Builder. Uh, the command is build, and then you give the name of the execution environment. And the container runtime is could be Docker or Podman. I'm just using Docker. And then the verbosity is three, just to show you that what all it does. So if I run this, you would see it does a lot of stuff. Um, uh, this is the Ansible Galaxy command that it runs to fetch the roles in the collections. Uh, and then this is the requirements.txt which i had for the python uh, dependencies says i'm not using it it's not going to bring anything extra um, and then in the end uh, if i can show you it creates the build tech context um, and this is the context which contains your container file as well so if i just go into context and show you the docker file uh, so this docker file is also created so you can share this docker file uh, with anybody uh, and then they can create this container image by themselves if you don't want to share your image itself. Uh, so if I go back and I show you the image that it has created. Um, so if you remember, the name I gave it was the my first EE. So if I just do uh, let me pull this up. So if I just do Docker run my first EE, and if I do a pip list. Or in fact, I if I do Ansible Galaxy collection list, this should show me the Amazon AWS collection that I installed in my container image. Um, so if you see, uh, it shows that it has installed the Amazon AWS in this uh, container image that I've created. Uh, if I just do a pip list, it should show the Boto package, uh, uh, which this collection requires. So I'm going to do, oops, that's a typo there. So if I do, if I look for Boto, it should, oh wait, sorry. Not bad. I think I was running the wrong command there. So maybe so if I do pip list and grab for Boto, it, it has brought all these Python packages as well in this container now. And now if I, I if I want to actually see whether you know I can run some playbooks, uh, all you have to do is use the Ansible runner. So that would be something like this. So if I do Ansible runner playbook, and if I do if I give the container image as my container image that I just use. And then this is the playbook that I've got, which just fetches one of the AMI information. Um, for this Ansible, uh, so this Ansible runner I'm running out of source. Uh, if you happen to install the Ansible runner from PyPy right now, uh, you may not get the container image option in it. So what you have to do is install it from the source. 
Um, so if I just do this, uh, they should run this test AWS AMI playbook that I've got, which should fetch the AMI from AWS for me using the container image that I just created. So it went to AWS and fetched this AMI and I'm using the container image that I just created. Um, so in, in context of AWS, like I mentioned, right, uh, custom virtual environments had some shortcomings. Those were not uh, easily shareable um, and our users felt uh, there needs to be something which can be easily shared and container images are you know very easily shareable um, so this is what you know execution environment gives us uh, and yeah I mean that's it that's it that's all I had for this uh, talk if there are any questions I can probably answer them thanks Nikhil um, I think there might be something in chat yeah, Felix asked, uh, is there any, uh, is there some documentation for collection maintainers, what they need to do in order to support Ansible Builder? Uh, so basically you need to have the correct metadata. Um, that's the, that's that's given for any Ansible collection, right? Uh, you need to have the correct metadata with all the dependencies in there and that's it, uh, nothing else. Uh, once you have the correct metadata, Ansible Builder will go and read that metadata, fetch all the dependencies that you need for that collection, and install it in your execution environment. So, I mean, this is a significant in user interface change. Uh, is this going to be something that everybody has to go and change things for? Or uh, how, how does this play out? Um, I mean, I understand how this fits within the Ansible Tower space. Uh, because that's the interface that's currently being, well, it's a small modification to an interface there. But for the general Ansible community, this is a significant change. Um, I think uh, for the community part, um, so this execution environment is just another way to use the Ansible runner. Um, it is not something that, you know, you would have to uh, be forced to use. Uh, the normal traditional Ansible playbook run that you usually do is still going to be there. That's what I suppose. I think David and the others can probably chime on that, but I think that is still there. This is just another way of if, if you want to use the container images, a more shareable, you know, content that you want to uh, share with your users. This is how you would use it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so, uh, oh, this yeah, this so, is Brad. Uh, I, I can, yeah. I can yeah, check. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. The use of Ansible Runner and the whole concept of execution environments is really targeted toward uh, you know the, the Ansible Automation Platform user. So it's a it's it's part of the migration strategy from the Ansible package at the command line, where you're pip installing and you're kind of productionizing your playbooks and your content, and getting ready for them to be in your enterprise deployment of Tower. So, it's it it it's a layer above the community experience is the way that I think about it, and that's exactly what it's it's for. That's the positioning of it because the ability to use an execution environment locally is really a lead into when Tower is using execution environments as well. Right, so it's it's kind of that the three steps you run locally with the community uh, with the Ansible package, pip install, content collections. Um, if you're a platform customer, then you start looking toward uh, Ansible Builder to define execution environments, and then those execution environments alongside the content you created would be promoted to your enterprise deployment. So I think I think you're spot on there, noticing the that it's not the community experience that everybody's familiar with. Uh, and that's not really what it's targeted for either. Yeah, and and just just to just to uh, clarify, uh, looking forward, uh, there are no plans to discontinue the the Ansible package on PyPy or anything. Uh, it's it's still going to be available, and it's not mutually exclusive uh, with other ways to run and consume uh, Ansible content. Yeah, and it's. You know, I think it's. I think these two tools, Builder and Runner, uh, I think are one of the first times that you can you can really see a distinction between what is the community Ansible package versus what are the open source components that are used within the platform, and that's that's kind of where the line sits. 
Great. Thank you. Yeah. So on top of that, like you can imagine it can solve a lot of things. Like uh, if you have a complex Python dependencies or complex collection dependencies, uh, then you can just create one container and share it with your customers or community members so that they can directly uh, use that uh, and uh, start working on that. So it's just another way of uh, executing your playbooks. Uh, I don't think there is a major change in uh, executing the way you execute your playbooks. Yeah. I think uh, there was one more question in the chat. Is it possible to bundle all the playbooks and inventory in the Docker image which we build with Ansible Builder? Uh, so, so a collection already has your playbooks, right? So, if you are using a collection or if you have your own collection, you can make it part of your execution environment or the Docker image, and that will have the playbooks as well. Uh, for the inventory, uh, I don't think so. That will be part of the the container image. Uh, inventory would sit outside of the container image because that gives you the ability to just use the image with any inventory that you want to write. So, so inventory won't be part of the container image, but the playbooks can be part of the container image via the collection itself. <clears throat> yeah, the, the container here is really, you can almost think of it as the kind of the Ansible automation platform equivalent to the bundled An Ansible package on the community side, right? Because it is it is the community that is bundling Ansible 3 and Ansible 4 along with all of the collections on the on the platform side. Um, the execution environment is is the way that those collections get uh, bundled together and used by by Tower. Hey, Andres. Hey, I mean, I just wanted to chime in and say, you know, it's 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 probably tough for contributors, people on this call, when you see a tool like this out of nowhere, and you have no context, right? So when you see something like this, there's the reason why this was created, right, was to help drive what Brad said was an ends for uh, a means for an enterprise use case, right? Being able to scale execution, uh, right, and help the developer experience in large. Uh, automation estates. This doesn't mean that every, that you have to start containerizing, right? This is why pip install Ansible will always be there from a community perspective, and the community team can can chime in here, right? But this is this is a a slight divergence um, due to the requirements and needs of the enterprise that we have in the product, and because of that, we have to we've had to develop new tools in order to satisfy those. And Builder is one of those tools as it leads up to our next major release here later this year from a product perspective. So, um, and that means that, you know, at some point in time, uh, from a product perspective, execution must go through a container. That's going to happen, right, from a product perspective. Now, again, that doesn't mean that th that's the case that from a community perspective. Again, PIP and Solansville will always be there and from a foundational standpoint. Hopefully that helps with some context. But, but we know that community members are starting to get into the world of containers, and that's great. This will help them um, a more standardized way of, of doing so instead of a DIY. Everyone's doing it, everyone's doing it their own way, right? So maybe this will be a, a more standardized way uh, for people to, to create those containers. Yeah, it looks like a, um, a good tool to add to the tool set for distributing content in a different way uh, for the community. Um, and it totally makes sense for the enterprise uh, use case. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Nikhil and everyone. And uh, c feel free to continue chatting on in chat and RRC if you have questions. Uh, let's move on uh, to the next item on the agenda. Oh, but before I do that, um, we actually have uh, team member Andre Anderson, uh, who didn't get to introduce his, himself just now earlier in the beginning. Would you like to do a short intro? Yeah, 
Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm, cool. Uh, I'm Anderson, uh, WO7, uh, Andrew, and uh, I've been participating in Ansible for more than two years. Uh, and after that, uh, I got hired uh, by Red Hat, <coughs> and it's really great because uh, I can combine my passion and uh, my work. So, <coughs> thank you. All right, thanks.